Dang it. <laughs> One minute late. Technically, ah. it hit 9.06 right as I hit go live. I tried to be on time. Blame me, Brother Bob. It's it's on me. I will take blame. No excuses. There are no excuses, although I do have one. But I'm I'm going to say no excuses. I'll, I'll take the blame. That being said, I promise it is worth the one minute wait, or actually like three second wait. Sunil and I have a great show planned. The title of the show, I have proof. And I don't even know. It's funny because Sunil and I come up with topics. But when we do, we don't talk about it. We don't have each other's opinion on it. The title's going to give it away. But Sunil might be surprised by this. Proof that the 49ers are really good at drafting. I know. It sounds crazy. But I've got proof. We're going to talk about that. Plus. Much more next. All right, welcome back to Last Second Sports, where we are giving you our take down to the last second. And it's Tuesday night, which means I got my guy, So Real, Sunil in the building. Sunil, UFC 300 coming up this weekend. That's not what we're here to talk about, but I know you and I are both excited about that. We are here, however, to talk about the San Francisco 49ers. Brother, how you doing? Doing fantastic. I mean, April's been pretty good when it comes to sports you know obviously football is not around and football is king but last weekend was wrestlemania it was epic um this weekend is ufc 300 so you know yeah my weekends are still getting full filled with uh great sports and sports entertainment professional wrestling not mad at it well dude you've got the masters coming up this weekend in a week you've got haney versus garcia i mean this is a great month for sports absolutely and then the women's final four actually did better numbers than the men's final four oh, from the man. first time in like forever so fantastic month of sports overall and the draft is right around the corner so here we go like we're right here brother we're right here that being said before we get into draft content and that's what most of this show is about I want to talk about one Connor Williams. And this hit me this morning. I was on my way to go run some errands. And I was like, you know what? The 49ers can fix, in my opinion, they can fix their offensive line, not totally, but make it a lot better from the middle out and do it without drafting a guy. There's a player out there by the name of Connor Williams. He played in this system last year for the Miami Dolphins, 26 years old. Coming off of an ACL injury, I know that could be a little bit scary for some, but my thought was to go pursue Connor Williams. What do you think about this, Sunil? I mean, obviously, it's it reminds me too much of what the 49ers used to do early mm -hmm. and what the free agents that they picked up. And what I mean by that is if the guy is on the field, then, yeah, it's an upgrade over what you potentially have. The issue is usually when the 49ers take a shot on players like this that have checkered injury histories, and he would fall under that, obviously, with missing most of uh, mo most of the season last year. Um, I mean, uh, unless they were able to get him for, like, the vet men, but I'm not investing any type of cap space into him, Jesse, just because – we don't know what they what what else they're trying to do if there's a cornerback that they want to pick up or if you know somebody becomes available or you know one of these other because there's a lot of good free agents that are still sitting out there. Do I want to invest in, in somebody with a checkered injury history? To me, that's not bode well for the 49ers, and they've made an active policy, it seems like, through their draft picks, through um, you know, their free agents that they're looking for more durability than just like hoping, hey, this guy will stay healthy and he's an upgrade. Well, I'll, I'll say this. I'm going to make a case for him. So 49ers did sign uh, Yatir Gross Matos, and he has way more of a checkered pass. Now, 
Obviously, last year, Connor Williams did tear his ACL, but the three years prior, he suited up for all the games for three straight seasons. He's played left guard and he's played center in this league. He's probably a better center than he is guard, but he's still a very good guard, so that gives him a little bit of versatility. I know PFF is not the end-all, be-all. I understand that, but they usually have it together. If they give you a seasonal ranking, they're usually pretty good. If they have somebody rated a higher, higher, that's pr- usually a pretty good player. He was the number two rated center last year. So there's some good centers out there. They had Frank Ragnow ranked number one. I don't know that he's the best center in the league, but I would say he's probably top three for Detroit. At least that's how I view him. So them having him number one, I'm not necessarily mad at. And Connor Williams in his nine games, I know it wasn't a full season, but was ranked number two at the center position. So very good player, 26 years old, coming off of three fully healthy seasons before tearing his ACL. I don't necessarily, I'm not saying like, let's throw the bag at him, but the way I could see it is either get him on a one-year prove-it deal or sign him to like a three-year deal, but do it on the cheap and make it incentive-laden. And I'm not saying cheap to where you're not paying him nothing. I understand he's a very good player. You're not going to get him for nothing. But cheaper than what he would normally be if he was just fully healthy heading in the open market. Use kind of that injury to your favor and and make one of those two deals. I don't know. I, I like Brendel. I don't have an issue with him, but he's not near as good as what Connor Williams is. So for me, I would take a chance on it. Maybe even if it's on a one-year deal. God, I got to get a new camera holder. This thing's like bugging on me. Uh, I would, I would, even at the very least on a one-year deal, it's a major upgrade in my opinion. And there's not a lot of risk if you do that, but I understand what you're saying. You certainly don't want to go all in on a player, have him be injured. And then it's like, well, dude, what that didn't help us at all. So I get that too. And just more with the history of the 49ers, it hasn't worked out well. I mean, namely guys like Verrett, um, you know, D Ford, you know, these are guys that, you know, obviously, and, and I agree with you. If, if Connor Williams is healthy, Absolutely, you sign him. Well, the reason why he's still available is 32 teams right now don't feel like taking a risk or want to make sure that they get him at a certain price point. And he's probably asking for more right now or just waiting till after the draft to see, you know, who's still in need of, um, you know, that center guard position. Yeah, absolutely. And and it's one of those things, too, where you don't have to do it now. Kind of to your point, you can go through the draft process. Let's see what happens. Go through the draft process. Maybe you find that guy in the draft and you don't need Connor Williams, but maybe, maybe you don't. And then you can go get him and try to continue to make a run. I mean, this should be an all-in season, so why not go all-in if you need to? You know what I mean? Be, be the best team that you can be for this one season and kind of see where the chips fall after that. Because next year, it's going to be very different with all the free agents. So just something to think about. It's something I hadn't heard. And Connor Williams is an absolute stud. So I would kick the tires on it. Uh, Brother Bob says, better not freaking flake tomorrow, Kyle Levy lover. <laughs> ain't nobody flaking, brother. Don't be sitting here acting like you ain't changing around plans last minute and all that kind of stuff too. <laughs> Oh man, yeah, brother Bob, no accountability over there. You know, he's like, Oh, yeah, you better take accountability if you're late, Naylor. No accountability from this guy when he flakes. Exactly. I don't care if you were sick. You didn't show up. You didn't exactly. show up. I'm, st- I'm totally joking. <laughs> uh, all right. Let's talk about the draft a little bit. Let's talk. There has been some really good picks from the 49ers. There's some been some really bad picks from the 49ers. Maybe we should do both sides of this coin. Who was the worst pick and who was the best pick that the 49ers have made during the Shanahan era? We'll start with best pick. I know that we didn't plan on doing the worst pick. So, you know, if you don't have one off the top of your head, that's fine. But I figure maybe we can go down that route as well. But best pick in the 49er or the Shanahan era with the 49ers. What do you think? Yeah, and to me it's it's pretty simple. Uh, and just to give you kind of what I'm looking for is best bang for your buck, right? Like Mm -hmm. um, as far as where they were drafted and what they ended up becoming. And for me, anytime you get a perennial all pro player from a third round draft pick, like a guy like Fred Warner, who is on, on his way to become potentially a first ballot hall of fame type player. And you got him with a third round draft pick. That's by far to me the best draft pick that they've ever made. 
the the leadership that he brings, the the level of play that he has, the durability that he has, um, you know, and just where he ranks as far as linebackers in the league to get him for where they got him at. Um, you know, there's not any team in the league that wouldn't want Fred Warner on their team. And, you know, I'm sure there's 32 teams, oh, 31, right, that – we're like, why didn't we take him with the first or second round pick before he dropped to the 49ers in the third round? Yeah, he, that's pretty. That's a pretty good one. I mean, Kittle round five is a good one. So Ray here's Ma the thing with Kittle. Player. The reason yeah. why, because Kittle's on there too, but for me, durability. Fred Warner doesn't miss games, right? That's and true. Fred Warner, that's Fred true. Warner is the quarterback of the defense. So where Kittle obviously is a lower draft pick and potential first round hall of fame player as well. And obviously brings a ton to, to the team. He's missed multiple games due to injuries. And that's not something that you see with Fred Warner, which is interesting because they both play an extremely aggressive brand of football. Um, but somehow Fred Warner doesn't miss games. Um, George Kittle does. So to me, Fred Warner gets the nod there. Yeah. I, I can't argue it. Listen, <laughs> I mean, is a hell of a draft pick. And they've had some other good ones, right? I mean, we talk about a, a player making an all pro. Talanoa Fungo was a super late pick. Diamondor of the Norris coming into his own. I'm just trying to highlight some of the others. You know, Kittle we talked about. There's been some good draft picks. I mean, Elijah Moody, Mitchell came in Moody clutch. Moody was great. Right? Elijah Mitchell, uh, sixth rounder, came in clutch for that season that, you know, we didn't have a running back. Till CMC came in. I mean, they, they've they've done well in later on picks. No, they they really have, and and we're gonna highlight that a little bit later. But got it. I'm got actually it. surprised this is not the route you went. And I'm supposed to be the resident hater over here, but I gotta go with Brock Purdy. I think anytime you can get a quarterback who, listen, I don't necessarily think he's gonna be the franchise guy. Let let me backstep. I think the 49ers are gonna pay him to be the franchise guy. I don't know that he is gonna be that guy for sure. However, anytime you can get three years plus of starting, which is minimum what we're going to get out of them on this inexpensive contract, man, and you get it at a pretty high level, round seven, last pick in the draft at the most important position in football, I have to give the nod to that guy. Again, not the best player. Fred Warner's better, a better linebacker than Purdy is quarterback. I understand that. And to be fair, Fred Warner's been on this team longer. Understand that as well. But dude, a quarterback that's pretty good, a uh, above average starter at that that late, man, you 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 have to go Brock Purdy. I have to go Brock Purdy. So I'm gonna go with Brock Purdy for my pick as the best pick in the Shanahan era, just because the value is just stupid. Yeah. That that's that definitely is on the list as well. Bosa could be in there as well, right? I mean, we could throw Bosa in there. I understand he was like uh, the second pick in the draft or whatever he was, but still, it's like, dude, what more could you have asked for? He he hit every check mark that you were looking for, and they've had some other first rounders that were bust. So I know that you spent a lot on it. Maybe it's not like the best value, but the one of the best players on the team. Sure. He's going to be around for a long time. Like, there's there's a lot of players that we could throw into this for different I think, reasons. I think uh, Bosa does it even though you know obviously just player wise it is mm -hmm. great it's it, it's just he was a no-brainer right there wasn't much skill there wasn't like hey we 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 draft we like um hand picked this guy and and you know nobody else saw the potential and we you know like that's the first, that's year, where, the first year. yeah like where where i think fred warner and that's kind of on the other side you know i agree with you everything on purdy but purdy was kind of like a throwaway pick like oh man he's still here let's get him not like, hey, we identified this is the guy, and he kind of lucked out to be that guy. So I agree. Like, obviously, to me, I think Purdy, even though there was some skill involved, because they knew, hey, if he goes into free agency as an undrafted pick, we might not get him, and we want him on our roster. So there is some, you know, validity to that. But I think Fred Warner is that nice combination of, hey, this is the perfect guy for our system that paid off. Like. Fred Warner could fit and be this type of player on everybody's team. Anybody in the NFL would want him as their middle linebacker. 
I don't know if that's the same for what people would say about Purdy, even though he did work out for the 49ers. Yeah, absolutely. That's totally understandable. I mean, I think Fred Warner to a certain extent would work out anywhere, and I don't know that Purdy would. So that's a fair yeah. argument. Okay, just off the top of your head, I know that we didn't have a worse pick, but do you have a worse pick that you can think of? One that you're just like, dude, really? <laughs> I mean, their first ever pick was pretty bad. And Solomon <laughs> Thomas, but yeah, even though I love the guy, like I truly love and respect him, Trey Lance was the worst pick that they made. Oh yeah, it has to be because they um, spent so much capital on him, yeah, right? So much capital it, didn't didn't you know he, he didn't even wow Shanahan enough to ever give him like real starting time and you know all that all that type of stuff. Um, yeah, and just the impact of what those first round picks could have turned into and where this team could end up being uh with those potential first round picks, you know, you got to you got to look at that and be like that was the worst pick that they made. Yeah, the the capital, I mean, it really seals it. And again, it's not I still am in the camp like dude, we just never really even got to see the kid develop. I mean, who knows what it could have been, but Based off the timeline of the 49ers, it just and the fact that you weren't willing to start him day one, major mistake. The fact that you didn't realize, like, hey, we're drafting a player who has crazy upside but does need to be developed, and that you couldn't you didn't know that going into it is a bit weird. And to spend really the the major sin was spending all that capital, not necessarily for a player, but for a spot. And then be like, okay, we'll figure it out afterwards. We're going to look at all. We're going to look at Fields. We're going to look at Mac. We're going to look at Zach. And we're going to look at Lance. And we're going to make our pick. It's like, well, you should probably know who you want when you move up and know that that player is going to be available. Like, none of them really have panned out. But what if they really wanted Zach Wilson? And, oh, Zach's all of a sudden not available. Or, you know, who knows? Or they really yeah. wanted Justin Fields, but then they changed their mind. Or Mac Jones or whatever. Trading up for a spot is always super weird. You should know exactly what player you want and go for that the whole way through. It's a great segue because I think that's going to play into my analysis of the overall question of the of the day. So, Yeah, all right, all right. We're going to talk about it. Frank Tom Ocean says, thanks, guys, for all the great content. Go 49ers. Appreciate you, Frank Tom Ocean. Thank you so much for contributing. Wow, member for 12 months. A whole that's year. A long time, dude. Yeah, that's a long time, man. Happy I don't know, anniversary, Frank. I don't Frank. know why he wants to be here that long, but I appreciate <laughs> it. I appreciate it. Okay, let's let's talk about the 49ers. This is the meat and potatoes of the show right here. So bottom line, are they good at drafting? I mean, this is and this is an interesting thing because it's easy to point out where all the flaws are. And we also live in a bit of a bubble where we really pick through every single thing that the 49ers do good and bad and living in that bubble or that silo can kind of close you off to what other teams are doing good and bad. And maybe you think one way, but if it's really broken down, you're like, wow, it's, it's not actually that way. So in your opinion, do you believe that the 49ers are good at drafting? So this is, this is interesting because I think it, it, it depends on how you define what's good at drafting. Right. So, um, you know, I think there's a school of thought where, you know, you draft and if, you know, a certain percentage of your draft picks end up becoming, you know, players on your team, starters, rotational players, then, hey, you're good at drafting. Or if, you know, um, you know, you, certain play like certain rounds of the draft, you're able to get certain type of talent, then, hey, you're good at drafting or. You know, there's I, 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 I think there's a GM or a coach. I forget who it was, but says, you know, if you get an all pro player out of your one all pro player out of your whole draft, your whole draft was a success. And if you go by that type of logic, then, yeah, the 49ers are excellent <laughs> at drafting because ever since like 2017, each draft they've 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 had at least a, a all pro, if not two all pros, you know, 2017, it was Kittle 18. Um, I think it was Fred Warner 19, both Bosa and Debo, you know, 20, Ayuk 21, 
um, Huff, 22, you know, you got Brock Purdy in that draft and, you know, he's borderline last season could have been an all pro. Right. Um, so to me, when you look at, at it that way, yeah, the 49ers are great at drafting, but the issue for me, Jesse is how much they've missed in the first round. They've had seven first round picks. Only two are still on the team. Now, those two are Nick Bosa and Brandon Ayuk, both all pros. So you're like, yeah, they're great. But to have seven first round pick and five of those guys aren't even on your roster. Um, some of those guys you traded up to get, i.e. Ruben Foster. Um, you know, you've missed on guys up and down. You know, like when you pick a guy like Javon Kinlon, you could have potentially got, you know, uh, I think Tristan Wirfs was in that draft there, you know, whatnot. So to me, I think it's a mixed bag for the 49ers. I think that they're fine and solid. Like I would take what they have. I don't think they're terrible at drafting Jesse, but I think it's because of how much they've been bailed out in later rounds, their ability to, and I think what their biggest issue is, is their ability to stay d disciplined with best player available. And what I mean by that is in the later round draft picks, they tend to stick to best player available. And that's when they've had the most success. With the higher rounds, and what I mean by higher rounds, first, second, and third round, they tend to like what you just mentioned. They tend to identify a position and pick the best player that they feel like is at a specific position. And that's where I feel like they've gotten into a lot of trouble because they're identifying position instead of just taking the best athlete, the best player on the board, which is where they they end up having a lot of success. So, yeah, I mean, ultimately... I wouldn't say they're the best at drafting. I wouldn't say they're the worst at drafting, but um, I would say, you know, they're like top. They, 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 they wouldn't be like, they would still be in the honors classes. Let's just put it that way. Yeah, absolutely. You know, there's, there was something I stumbled on like two years ago. It was a graph and it broke down teams, draft picks and, you know, how often they hit and all those other things. And I, I wish I could find it. And I, I wasn't successful for this, but I was able to stumble upon some other things. And, and I want to show this to everybody because I there is no exact science. Kind of to your point where it's like, hey, if you get an all pro, that should be a successful draft. I, I think when we look at it, especially when we look at the first round, we, we expect elite players. And when you don't have that, Mike McGlinchey is a great example, right? A good player. He got a second contract in the league, but we look at that and say, ah, yeah. Kind of a bust for the 49ers. But here's the reality. And this is how I'm going to gauge success. And this is why I say the 49ers are actually really good drafters. So do you realize that 60% of the players that are drafted make it to their second contract? So immediately, no matter where they're drafted, almost half the players don't even make it to contract number two, whether it's from injury, uh, they're just not good enough, whatever. They they don't make it. They get in trouble with a law who knows but 60 percent, only 60 percent, make it to contract number two less than half of those players that make it to contract number two make it to contract number two with the same team that drafted them which is crazy so out of the 60 percent, less than half of those players make it to contract number two with the team that drafted them so we're talking about less than 30 percent of the overall players drafted are going to make it to contract number two with the team that drafted them. So here's the breakdown. And I've got it right here. 31% of players drafted in round one make it to contract number two with the same team that drafted them. Okay, so you, you look at guys like uh, Kinlaw, where maybe Kinlaw makes it to contract number two. He's a part of that 60% that make it to contract number two, but he wasn't good enough to make it to contract number two with the 49ers. He needed to change his scenery, right? So he's yeah, successful, and, and, and but not really, all, right? Go ahead. And I don't I don't think it's always going to be good enough. Sometimes it's cap, right? Sure. You don't have the cap. So uh, I don't want to, sure. I mean, with Kinlaw, obviously we didn't want to invest in him, but I don't think that's always the case, right? Sometimes it's going to be- Absolutely. Uh, like Brian Burns, right? Let's say Brian Burns didn't sign, sign his second contract For with sure. Panthers. Obviously he's good enough to be- on the team, they just couldn't afford them. Khalil, that's Mack fair. Guy, so that's totally fair. And there, so there's Butler. things on. 
Yeah, right, right. Okay, totally fair. So there's there's players that go to another team because they are worth a ton of assets sometimes. So that was a, a successful draft pick. Forrest Buckner, I don't think anybody would say he was a bust. His second contract was with another team because of that. Okay, that's totally fair. But the way I'm going to gauge success just for this exercise, because I think it's the only fair way that I can think of is, let's just go off of what the numbers tell us. The numbers tell us that 31% of players drafted in round one make it to contract number two with the team that drafted them. Well, the 49ers, as bad as we assume that they are at drafting players in round one, 29%, so 2% under the norm of their first round draft picks have made it or are on their way to making it. Some of this is a projection. Obviously, I'm projecting IU to get a second contract with the 49ers. So 29% puts them almost in line with the league average of players drafted that they drafted that have made it to a second contract with them. Okay, let's go down the list. Round two, 24% of players that are drafted in the NFL make it to a second contract with the team that drafted them. The 49ers currently are at 50% hit rate on that. That puts them 26% above the league average. We go to round three, they're 10% above the league average. Round four, 38% above the league average. Round five, 37% above the league average. Round six, 2% above the league average. And round seven, 38% above the league average. Now, this is not an exact science. I totally get that. But when you look at what you said, which is almost every year, they've figured out a way to get an all-pro caliber player out of their draft. And then you couple it with what the numbers tell us as far as teams or players that get second contracts with their team one way or another, the 49ers are well above the league averages in every single round except for round one. I would say they've been pretty good at drafting. Pretty good yeah. at drafting when you couple those two things. And it, like I said, I think it's easy to understand why they falter in round one. And it goes back to just that. They, they don't stay disciplined. I think what they do... And round two and three actually um, impressed me because I personally still think in rounds two and three, uh, they, they tend to get pick like, you know, terrible players in those rounds. Um, For sure. But uh, four through seven, I, I completely understand because they just do so well, you know, four through seven. But once again, I think four through seven, they stay disciplined and best player available. Whereas in rounds one, two, and three, they tend to just reach for a position, quote unquote, of need that they identify and they just kind of force that pick rather than just stay disciplined with their draft board. Yeah, and that that definitely might be the case. I just I was actually kind of shocked when I was going through it. I was like, man, that's that's lo lower numbers than what I expected across the league. Not even necessarily shocked at the 49ers success, but how low the numbers were for even round one, 30%. So no matter what, the 49ers are going to have a 30% chance of their first round pick, assuming they make one this year, being with the 49ers six years down the line, five years down the line on a second contract. That's extremely low. I, I didn't think it would be that low. Yeah, and I think, I think a lot of it, like we said, there's obviously players that bust, players that get injured, players that end up, you know, not being in the league for, you know, uh, legal issues or whatnot. But an another one is just a, a lot of these first round picks, even if they're, even if they're, even the great ones are going to be extremely expensive in that second contract. So teams t have to be flexible with their cap or, or be managing their money well to be able to keep some of these picks as well. So, yeah, I mean, I think it would be interesting to look at the top teams um, and see what their numbers are because obviously compared to the rest of the league, I don't think it matters. Compared to Kansas City Chiefs, compared to the Eagles, compared to you know some of these teams that are consistently contending, I wonder where we stack up with them. And I still think it will be relatively the same. I bet you through four through seven – we're significantly better and rounds one, two, and three, we are not as good.
Yeah, I mean, the perception is the Chiefs are a good drafting team. The Eagles are a good drafting team. It probably wouldn't take me long. I mean, I'm not going to do it on the show, but it wouldn't take me long to run the numbers against teams that are perceived good drafters and see how the 49ers stack up using this method. Again, it's not perfect. I understand that, but I think it's pretty good. Like, it's it's a fair way to at least look at it. Maybe we can do it for the next show. We'll t- uh, If you can do the last, let's say the last, three Super Bowls, the teams in the last three Super Bowls and Mm -hmm. put us against them and see what, um, what, what we look up. Because I think ultimately when we're looking at answering this question, Jesse, it's like, cause we know this draft is extremely important for the 49ers to continue to be contenders, right? Because now all of that cap flexibility we had from not having to pay a quarterback 40, $50 million dollars, we, we were able to just pay high level talent and keep all of our high level talent. Whereas that's not going to be the situation come next year. We're going to have to really rely on drafting guys that outplay their contract, perform higher than what we're paying them. And that's what the, I think that's the name of the game, right? Anybody could pay, like see a good talent and pay them top money and have them play on their team. But can you, draft a guy where he's outplaying what you're paying him. That's ultimately what I think the great teams do. And the 49ers are able to do that in their later round picks. Are they going to be able to do that now that they have, you know, first, second round uh, back? Because it's important that they get high level talent that's going to outplay their contract because the 49ers aren't going to be able to just go out there and sign a big name, sign big name guys when they're paying their guys so much. Yeah. And I mean, obviously doing a, another round and kind of adding some of that in will give us a little bit more context, but I've got to imagine, I don't care how you slice it, that these numbers here, these higher percentages where it's like they're 26% above the league average, 38%, 37, 38. There's four rounds right there where they're probably a top three team sure. uh, without doing any analysis. It's not one. Number so one. yeah, you're right. Yeah. Worst case scenario, let's say top five team in four of the seven rounds. I'd say you're doing pretty good. Like, yeah. Overall, that's pretty good. So yeah, it, absolutely. I guess, the, I guess the point is, is that, and even I've fallen into this a little bit where I'm like, God, it just feels like they draft horribly. Sometimes, you know, you, you remember you, it, it's no different than if you spend time on the internet, you could hear, you could have 10 people tell you something good. And the one person that says something bad, that's what sticks with you. Mm-hmm. Same thing goes when you look at, at the draft picks. You look at it and go, man, God, yeah, sure, they had Fred Warner and Kittle and, and Lenore and Huff and all these other guys, but what about TDP? <laughs> yeah. Talk to me about Sermon. You know what I mean? So, like, those are the ones that are going to stick with you. But reality is all these teams miss at a pretty high rate on a regular basis. It's a lot like baseball where, yeah, you're a damn good hitter, if you can hit 35% of the time, you're elite of the elite. Yeah. Like you're you're the upper echelon of hitters ever. So that's that's the way this is. Like, yeah, you're probably gonna hit at a low percentage. It's just the way that it works. Yeah. And that's where, you know, when it comes to this year's draft, I am one of the guys that even though I know offensive line is like the most important position. I would hope that they don't reach just because they need an offensive lineman. Um, Rather just take the best player available. And maybe that's not an offensive lineman, but, you know, or trade back to get like the pick where you need to be valued so you could get more picks. I think a lot of people are just that desperation mentality is what gets us in trouble. And I think some of the fan base is in that desperation. Like just take a, just take offensive lineman. Well, if the offensive lineman isn't is ranked, you know, rated 45 and you're picking at 31, you shouldn't take the 45th best player at 31. You either draft back to closer to 45 or you take someone who's, you know, take take that best bang for your buck. Yeah, the more and more I think about it, I mean, early on it was like, okay, stand pat or move up. But I'm really getting on the the trade back train right now. Like that's mm-hmm. the last few days, that's kind of where my head's been at. It's like, okay. Yes, it's a really good offensive line draft. I think that you can get some good offensive linemen in round two at a really good value. And especially if they're going to maybe even sit a year, it's like, all right, just let them 
be a round two pick. Go collect more assets. Maybe that's a future pick by trading back, or maybe that's more picks in this draft so that you can maneuver again You know, with your later round two pick, your round three pick. You can move up if there's a guy that you really like and use some of those draft picks and, and have that maneuverability. For me, I think the 49ers should consider trading down in there. And of course, they're going to do that. They're, they're going to look at all options when their time comes. But they're in that prime spot where teams want to sneak back up into round one to get any player on that fifth-year option. And that allows you to go back four, five, six spots, get some good assets, and use that to maneuver around in this draft and kind of be in control of the draft. I really am starting to look at it and say, man, trading back really might be the best deal. Now it sucks because... We finally have a first round pick and we're excited about it. Draft day comes and they trade back. It's like, ah, oh, damn. Now we got to wait till tomorrow. But I think it might be the best move. I really do. Yeah, especially because now the 49ers have to. So this is where the 49ers have to shift their thought process, right? And a team that I admire when it comes, or I guess a GM that I admire is Howie Roseman with the Eagles. The amount, he always has two first round picks. Like, I, I don't understand how, yeah. how he has it, but every year he has multiple first-round picks, and it's because they're constantly drafting later in the first round, and rather than selecting a guy with that first-round pick, you draft back into the second, stack up another first-round pick, and then you ultimately always are playing from an aggressive perspective that – um <laughs> what <laughs> you just said your dog took a dump on the couch it's funny nah. um but yeah but like uh to me i think that the, that's this is the first time the 49ers are, are needing to think about that because they need more high level talent they can't keep um banking on later round draft picks playing like first round talent like that's not always gonna that even though that's been kind of their mo i don't think that's something you could continue to bank on um, you need to start drafting first and second round talent to play like first and second round talent. And the way that you do that is stacking more and more picks for that. So I think that absolutely, if they could get like a future first draft, you know, because anywhere between that 31 and 35, I think you're getting a similar caliber type player. Like it, it's not like the top 10. I think there's a, those top 10 players you're getting like above, usually above like, you know, uh, talent from the rest of the draft but when you're getting into that late first round early second round you're getting a lot of similar talent so if you could stack up more picks to me that's going to be most beneficial yeah absolutely class comes through and says what up positive fellas love the show i don't hear people talk much about to son how's he look could he be a 49er yeah, I haven't looked into him a ton. I mean, I did a little bit just because everybody was hyping him up and Frank Gore Jr., who plays very similar to his dad. But I, I talked about this about a week ago. I think if there's a player that comes from the 49er family tree, so to speak, it's McCaffrey's brother. He's he's the one. I, I mean, he is by far the best player out of all of them. He's athletically ranks in the top top tier of top tier receivers since like 1987 from an athletic standpoint he actually makes a lot of sense and where you're probably going to be able to get him you know i wouldn't be against drafting one of these other guys if you can get him for the right price but listen if you go get to son to says he'll come play for free so maybe it'll be worth it i don't know <laughs> brother bob says who gives a crap if you can't win the big super bowl yeah, I mean, but it's draft season, so we should probably talk about if they're good at drafting. I mean, there's, you know, these players are going to make a difference for years to come, potentially. I kind of give a crap, Brother Bob. Just Brother throwing Bob it out only there. cares about the game in February. If they don't win the game <laughs> yeah. in February, it doesn't matter. Brother Bob should just hibernate until February. Exactly. We'll We'll call you, we'll wake you up in February and tell you if they made it or not, and then you can watch it and be heartbroken. <laughs> And then go back to sleep. Brother Bob says, you count Lance for all four picks, three firsts and a third. I mean, you kind of have to. It's not necessarily his fault. I mean, the 49ers are the ones that screwed it up, right? But yeah, I mean, you, I mean they screwed it how up. How else do you look at it? Them. They what? They screwed it up in the sense that they picked them. Yeah, but I mean, it's 
I just I think don't, just I thought, don't like sometimes it's like he still could be a really first round draft pick. I mean, he's at the second organization and not getting any playing time. So I don't know. Like, well, yeah, that's, because that's they've got a really good quarterback in place. I mean, what, regardless, what do you expect regardless, do, if he's a first round talent, he'd be playing in, in some organization right now. I think ultimately Maybe. he was just drafted wrong. I don't I don't think it, there's that many players that are like first round talents that just aren't playing on on rosters that, yeah i don't think that there are that many players that are drafted top five that don't really ever play but three or four games either i mean this is the most this is probably the most unique situation i've ever seen from a draft pick and a lot of it does come come down to COVID. i think that played a big part in it you get a, a unique year and that COVID was which is arguably the most unique year that we've ever lived through so you're going to get some unique situations. Um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know that he's necessarily a first round pick, but I also, I don't necessarily look at him as a bus in the traditional sense of like, he can't play football either. And I think people will look at him and be like, Oh, we know after three and a half games, he absolutely can't play football. It's like, I don't know what you saw in those three and a half games. that says definitively he can't play football. It's just a unique situation. And I know for a fact that, teams did call on trading for him during this offseason uh one of which was willing to give him a shot now it doesn't mean it would have gone well but the dallas cowboys were unwilling to trade him so i don't know i don't know what that says either you know I, i'm not sure that that says he's he's any better off or any worse off than what we necessarily thought but a lot of it comes down to circumstances like what what are you supposed to do man like you got a small chance you got replaced deservedly so in San Francisco, and then you got traded to sit behind a guy who's making sixty million dollars. Like I, I don't know what to tell you. It's a weird situation. It's a weird situation. Yeah. So, but he's a, but regardless of why, I agree. I just said he was the worst draft pick in the Shanahan era. Doesn't matter why. I'm just not willing to say, oh, it's because he sucks. No, it's the 49ers didn't have a good game plan for him. They were unwilling to to do what they should have done, which was play him year one, allow him to develop because you were trying to also win a Super Bowl at the same time. You felt that the veteran Jimmy Garoppolo gave you the best chance. That's great. You fell short. You screwed up the whole situation. Now you've got a, a good player in Brock Purdy, and hopefully you do the right thing here, and you can win a Super Bowl while he's on the rookie rookie deal. That's the hope. Or if he's paid. I don't think it I don't think it matters if they win and Brock Purdy gets paid and they still win a Super Bowl like just win a Super Bowl with Brock Purdy. No, it it doesn't, but I, I mean I think your chances go down drastically. If sure. if you're not going to win it like what what is out there if if I say, "Hey, Brock Purdy is cheap for this year and next year and the 49ers don't win a Super Bowl." 3 years they had him on an inexpensive contract. Now you're going to give him top-tier quarterback money. What makes you think that paying a guy crazy amounts compared to what he was making is going to all of a sudden be the formula to help you win when he wasn't able to win on a rookie deal. I, I mean, I don't know. I don't know how anybody could think that that's possible at that point. I'm not saying it's impossible, well, but man, I, mean, I, I wouldn't there, believe in there's it. There's a lot of, there's a lot of QBs that you would look at and say, yeah, they have no shot, right? You'd say that with Josh Allen. You would say that with Joe Burrow. You would say that with uh, Jalen Hurts. Like, None of these guys won it on their rookie contracts. Does that mean they're never going to win a Super Bowl? Uh, I mean, ultimately, if you're able to elevate players around you or you're able to play, you know, a brand of football that's winning, then that's more what matters, right? Ultimately versus, you know, just having tons of talent on your team. So, yeah, I, I see the I see that, but I, I understand because through the numbers and through analytics, having a guy on your rookie contract um, is going to give you the best chance to get to a Super Bowl, win a Super Bowl, or if you have a guy by the name of Patrick Mahomes. But ultimately, I don't think it's also you're never going to win it if you're paying a guy if he's the right guy, right? Obviously, Patrick. As Mahomes long as he's elite, guy. yeah, he's got to be elite for sure, or the right yeah. guy for the system, right? So. You know, uh, you got to be, you got to be elite. <laughs> I'm not budging off that you got to be elite because in the salary cap era, the only guys that have won and been paid have been elite. 
Like there's just, there is no other option. So the next time it happens, it'll be the first time it happens. So if Brock Purdy gets paid and he's not elite, I don't give a fuck about the system. Excuse my French. I don't cuss very often, but <laughs> he's not the right guy. Like he's right. just not, and he's not going to win it. So he's, he has to be elite if he's going to get paid. He has to period. There is no other option. Uh, okay. Yeah. We already got that one. Eric Chapman says, 49ers drafting in those rounds attributed to Kyle, John, or Adam Peters. I guess we'll find out this year. Yeah, I think, Eric, honestly, this might be something that we don't find out for a couple of years because Adam Peters was still a big part of the process up until really the very end of the year. So a lot of these players, you know, maybe Adam Peters gave them insight into who to draft. I, what I'm curious to see is, and this is something we're not ever going to know, but I want to know, how many times the 49ers, the 49ers and the Washington Commanders front office step on each other's toes when it comes to drafting guys potentially, like knowing that the other team might be interested. That's something that, again, we're not going to know the answer to, but you got to imagine it's going to happen maybe a little bit more than normal. But ultimately, in a few years, yeah, we're going to find out not not just him, but uh, you know, Ran went to the Titans the year before. So we're going to see if if the 49ers have some good people in house that they've been able to elevate to help out with these draft picks and continue to be good drafters because as we laid out they've been pretty good to this point. Will that trend continue? I don't know. It's really hard to say. It really is. And you know, I, I don't know. Like you said, I don't think we definitively can say, but at least from, you know, hearing how the draft picks do go, it does seem like a huge collaborative effort. Um, mm -hmm. they do really listen to their scouts. It just seems yeah, like they, they, once again, I think it has more to do with discipline and draft and draft philosophy versus scouting the right guys. I think they're able to scout the right guys. I think they just, the, the, the picks that they reach for, they tend to get wrong. Um, the picks that they kind of let fall into their laps, they tend to do really well with. Yeah. Yeah, that's the perception anyways. I, I would tend to agree with that. Brother Bob said, yeah, we we understood what you were saying with the last one. But yeah, of course. Otherwise, it would be Solomon Thomas, <laughs> right? The answer would be Solomon or, Thomas otherwise. No, or this, uh, the second first round pick they picked in that draft. Foster? Yeah, Ruben yeah Foster. maybe Foster. Yeah, that might be true. Because Solomon Thomas, not only did he represent, I guess Kinlaw, you could throw in there too, yeah, right? Because he represents be getting rid of Buckner. But he, not only does he represent the first pick that you had in this regime, but he represents passing on Patrick Mahomes. Right. <laughs> so it, whether that's fair or not, that's what he represents. So Solomon Thomas certainly would be in the conversation. I think if you if you didn't have all those assets tied to Trey Lance, like let's say they stayed at 13 or whatever and drafted Trey Lance and, and it didn't pan out, or they drafted Mac Jones and it didn't pan out, I don't think we would be having the same conversation, but you have to factor in all that they gave up for him. I mean, that that did happen. You can't act as if it didn't, and that's why he it has to be the worst pick, regardless of why, it has to be. And it goes back to them identifying a position and reaching versus, you know, just kind of letting the draft board play out to them. So. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. How important is this draft? I mean, we, we've just talked about it. You know, one of the things that I've been talking about, and I, I don't know that you've heard me say this, Sunil, and if, if you have, I apologize, but I've definitely been saying it over the last few shows, the 49ers have 39 unrestricted free agents next year. I mean, this is a lot of players, man, a lot of players that they've got to figure out. Going forward, this team's going to look very different, I would presume. And that's not including, you know, what if... Trent Williams retires. You know what I mean? That's not including Debo Samuel. Did, do you decide to move on from his contract or Kittle after this year? So there could be more casualties that aren't even a part of the unrestricted free agent circuit in 2025. So does that give added importance on this year's draft in your opinion? Yeah. And, and, and I think more than that, because yeah, ultimately that's that. And then also, we're going to have a, a we're going to be paying a quarterback. So to me, this is the first draft where the 49ers strategy has to change because ultimately the guy they have to hit 
more often on these picks because this is going to be the talent that they – this is going to be their best chance to get high – High contract, like how, how do I wear this? This is going to be the their best chance to get those expensive players at cheap cost. Because if in the past they've been able to, okay, we we might not have been able to solve this um, through the draft, but we could go out and get a Mooney Ward. We could go out and get a Leonard Floyd. We could go out and get you know um, a, a, a Javon um, Hargraves. They're not going to be able to do that once they pay Ayuk, once they pay Purdy. They're not going to have that same flexibility because they're paying, um, you know, they're paying uh, Nick Bosa. They're paying Fred Warner. They're paying, you know, Debo. They're paying, you know, all of these guys. So now their their ability to get that same level of talent has to be through the draft with these first and second round picks. Unfortunately, they haven't had a consistent track record getting those type of players in the first and second round. They've been banking on getting maybe one or two of those guys and later on in the draft, but they have to start hitting more and more on that because even if they miss, they don't have that cap space to be able to erase that mistake like they've been able to do recently. So to me, it's, it's extremely important. Now they have to start hitting way more because they're not going to have that flexibility to make up for it unless they start not paying some of their own talent. Yeah, absolutely. And, and the way that I look at it as well is the 49ers have, I think, 11 picks in this year's draft. Now, while I don't necessarily expect them to make all 11 picks, I sure would like to see them make at least nine. You know, if they may, if they maneuver around a little bit, give yourself as many opportunities to hit on these players because the only way to stock the cupboard right now is through the draft. You don't have a lot of money to play with. You don't have a lot of money to play with going forward. And you're going to want to sign a lot of your your key free agents. You're probably going to want to pay Brandon Ayuk and Brock Purdy. And so that makes these draft picks even more important going forward. You know, when you decide to move on from good players like the Kansas City Chiefs have done with Tyreek Hill, and now Sneed, you've got to be able to hit on draft picks that are coming back in return. And so if the 49ers do decide to, to move off of guys in the future, that means that the draft picks that are coming back or the draft picks in general that they have have to match that output in some way or another eventually. So this draft is so important. Next draft is so important. Really, these next two years are going to be crucial. And then going forward, I mean... That's the only way that you can get young, cheap talent. You don't get it through free agency. You can get talent through free agency, but you don't get young, cheap talent through free agency. Sure. And that's what the 49ers really have to be able to bank on, especially if they're going to pay a quarterback big-time money. So this draft is extremely important, absolutely. Yep, they have to, they have to start drafting guys in the first and second round that are worth $25, $30 million a year. Otherwise you know, they're not going to be able to stay up at the top like they've been, at least from a talent perspective. Yeah, absolutely. Brother Bob, I, I see the question now, so I'm going to answer it. No, it did not factor into the 29%. You're saying on the chart that I, I had done, did I include the, no, because they didn't technically make a pick in the, the, in those drafts, I didn't factor them into the 29%. Now, if I did certainly, and maybe that is a fair way to do it. I mean, we can talk about that, but if I did, then that 29% becomes much less. And so I guess I guess maybe to be fair and say, hey, if we're going to count all those picks as going towards Trey Lance and it not working out, maybe all those picks should have factored in. And that 29% now come becomes much, much lower and it looks really, really bad in round one. So, yeah, I, I guess that's a fair way to do it. Which I think is more uh in line with how the 49ers do draft in the first round yeah yeah i i think that's totally fair that's totally fair and but no i i didn't and i i guess i misunderstood kind of what you were asking when you would ask that originally okay let's say the 49ers get one impact player from this draft not 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 players that can be you know players that can start but we're talking like bona fide superstar they get an all pro caliber player in this year's draft a guy that you're just looking at going man 
absolute steal or absolute hit in whatever round. If they were to get that guy, what position would you prefer that player to be at? It's tough, man, because there's they've got some spots where they could really use it. They could really use it. I'm going to go receiver. Okay. Wow. And the reason why I'm going receiver, so I'm thinking receiver, by the time a rookie from this draft class is getting paid, and he's, let's say he's a top level, he's going to be $30 million a year, right? Mm. I think both of us agree Debo's gone next season. We both believe Ayuk's going to get paid. True. To me, for this team, for a guy like Purdy to still be successful, he's going to need weapons on the outside that could catch the ball. So to me, to have a bona fide impact weapon on offense to replace Debo is extremely important for this offense to continue to be successful. And uh, I'm thinking a guy that's a $30 million player that you're paying, you know, a couple million a year. To me, that's where I want to see that that kind of impact player to continue the success that the 49ers have. So for me, wide receiver. Man, I did not expect you to go wide receiver, but I like your line of thinking. That's fair. That's fair. Okay. Okay. Gosh, it's really hard not to say offensive line. It really is. But that's not, it's not sexy. That's not a sexy thing to say. And what's an impact player on offensive line? Like, I, I mean, Tristan Wirfs. If you get a Tristan Wirfs, that's pretty impact, right? That is, that, that is, but I don't know if that, nice tool. let's say they have the best offensive line, but they don't, but they don't have impact players on defense and they don't have impact players at the skill position. Does that take you to the Super Bowl? I don't know. I know we've been getting to the Super Bowl without, uh, high level impact offensive line. I don't know. I haven't seen us get to the Super Bowl without uh, impact on defense, impact players on defense and impact players at the skill positions on offense. Well, I mean, I think if Brock Purdy is who people think he is and he's protected and has some time, that might be the way to go. I'm not sure. going to go all line because it's not like I said, it's not sexy. It's probably the right answer. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I think it's probably the right answer, but I'm not going to go there. I'm not going to go there. I'm going to go corner. I'm going to go corner because the 49ers have, I mean, they've done a, a pretty good job the last couple of years kind of rebuilding this cornerback room. But as great as they have done, I don't know. I still don't know. And these guys are rare. I don't believe that they have a true lockdown corner. I believe Charvarius Ward's the number one corner because he's certainly top 32 in the league. It's probably closer to top 10 ish. But I, much like I look at quarterbacks where I say, hey, the, the top six or seven or so are elite, then you get some good players towards the back end of the top 10, but they're not the elite of the elite. I look at Charvarius Ward as that back end of the top 10 where he's a good player. He's not locked down elite, though. He's not one of those guys. So if I could get a lockdown corner, not only because I would love to have one, it's been forever since the 49ers have had one, but it makes the defense the defensive line's job a lot easier and looking at the future no matter how you slice it whether you think ambry at this point whether you think isaac yadam or ambry thomas are going to be starting outside no matter what both those guys are free agents so that means one starting corner presumably going to be a free agent next year charvarius ward is set to be a free agent diameter lenore set to be a free agent so all three of your starting corners potentially could be unrestricted free agents going into next offseason. Sure would make your job a hell of a lot easier if you drafted one that hit and was an impact player right away so that you could say, hey, I'm not going to get all three of these guys back, but I can get one of them and feel good about it and then maybe go draft another or bring in a cheap free agent and still have a really good cornerback room. But if they don't get that guy, and chances are they're probably not going to, you go into next offseason potentially with your whole starting secondary as far as corners go, being unrestricted free agents. Damn, that's scary. Yeah, <clears throat> it's interesting because I think we, I, I agree. I think that obviously we want them to hit there too. But I'm looking at where we are most expensive at. 
and where we want to get cheaper, but that's not right. drop in talent. So that's why I go wide receiver. And my second pick would be uh, defensive line because that's where we have the most 20 plus million dollar players that we want to get cheaper there, but not drop off talent. So to me, it would be wide receiver or defensive line would be the two right answers. I think the, the, the fan base is saying offensive line, but to me, like I said, I think we've won with, we've, we've shown that you don't need an elite offensive line for this team to still be extremely dominant, but you do need a lot of talent on the, uh, uh, as far as weapons. So that, that to me is where I'd rather get cheaper and higher talent is wide receiver or defensive line. Well, and kind of to your point, I mean, you're working at it from a different angle, but like, let's say they get rid of Debo's contract and then they replace him with a young, inexpensive wide receiver that frees up money to bring back a corner. Right or two, so in a roundabout way, you're kind of doing the same thing. Somebody's going to Purdy or paying, That's you know, Ayuk or paying, you know, whoever else's contract hits, whether it be Bosa's or Hargraves or whatever, you know. Mm. So to me, yeah. but I mean, I don't think there's a wrong answer. Like corner, obviously, if you have a high impact corner, that's going to make your team better. Um, I think just getting a high impact player at any position is helpful. Yeah, they need to hit everywhere, man. Like they just need to hit. Like if they're taking, like they have eleven picks. Let's say they pick. I think it's ten picks, right? Because they lost one. Um, No, they lost one next year. They had to move back in in one of the rounds. Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. So let's say they pick nine. Mm -hmm. I think six to seven of those guys have to be guys that could be starters. Just make them elite. All yeah, of them. I mean, elite, yeah. you would hope maybe two Let's or three, go all but in. <laughs> at least seven of them have to be starter, starting caliber, I would say, unless yeah. some of these guys... Rotational, at least on the defensive line or something, yeah. Yeah, I mean, eventually, eventually Kyle Shanahan is going to need to start playing starters, uh, start playing rookies as starters, because ultimately sure. they have to be better than the guys in free agency that you're bringing, because you're not bringing in expensive free agents anymore because you don't have that money so that's what i'm saying where the this philosophy has to start changing and this is the year that it has to start changing where you have to start picking guys that are going to be starters on your team impact yeah Mm -hmm. yeah most certainly i understand what you're saying this is a really good question by marco he says charvarius ward or demo who are you choosing so they're both unrestricted free agents who would you Decide to bring back if if you were choosing. I one. think this is easy. Diamond or Lenore. Thank you. I agree. Younger, it is easy. More versatile. Like having a guy who could play outside and inside. He's yep. younger. He's healthier. I mean, Charvarius Ward is. I think it, like you, player to player in one year. I think like you you take Charvarius Ward, but the length of the contract. Definitely Diamondo Lenore. He gives you more flexibility, and he's not that much of a drop-off right now, and I think he's just going to get better. I don't think it's even, yeah, I, mean, I don't think that's even a hard decision to make if you're the 49ers. If it comes down to that player or that player, if they don't choose Diamondo Lenore, I, I would highly question their thought process in that. Yeah, I mean, he's three and a half years younger. You know, he is more versatile. Yeah, I agree. I agree with that. And he probably would be cheaper, oddly enough, which is kind of crazy to think about. So that being said, I will be live on two channels tomorrow. I'll be on with uh, Dan Mitchell. Uh, Check out his channel. He's a Buffalo Bill content creator, but he's having me on to do a mock draft. Um, I don't think that's going to be live, though, so he might not release it tomorrow. And then I'll be on with Grant. And then Thursday, I'll be here with Marco. Marco and I are going to be doing a show on Thursdays going forward. So looking forward to that. As always, Sunil, thank you for joining me. We put in an hour's worth of work tonight. Couldn't couldn't have done it without you. Appreciate you. Much love to the chat. Be back soon. Peace.